Dragon's Dogma 2 is coming up quick, and there is plenty you gotta know, and we got it right here. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 10 things you need to know about Dragon's Dogma 2. Let's get right into it. Starting off at number 10, the world of Dragon's Dogma, uh, it's like this. Dragon's Dogma is an action RPG. It's primarily about hunting down gigantic enemies, which makes it sound like a medieval fantasy monster hunter, but there's a lot of weird stuff about it that makes it different. I'm going to get into a bunch of little details about this game that are very unique among action RPGs, but a good place to start is the world because it's about as far from your standard open world game as it gets. For one thing, it's roughly four times the size of the map from the original game, according to the game's director, Hideaki Itsuno. As a quick aside, just the fact that Itsuno is back is kind of incredible. Like, he directed the original game back in 2012 and is the heart of the Devil May Cry series. The only one he didn't direct was one and the reboot. So our man knows action games and the way that it is designed to be explored is unique. Uh, you got fast travel with ox carts, but they're limited. They don't take you everywhere. So you're going to be spending most of the time on foot. Itsuno seems to have like a special interest in making traveling fun. In an interview with IGN, he said, travel is boring. That's not true. It's only an issue because your game is boring. He gives examples of how Dragon's Dogma keeps the world fresh by giving unique enemy encounters that appear through different means. And he makes a lot of locations draw the player's eye and makes them real interesting to explore. As an example of a unique enemy encounter, one thing that can happen is you actually get attacked by uh, enemies while riding an ox cart. So monsters aren't just hanging out in specific areas. They can ambush out of nowhere, kind of like a random event in um, Red Dead 2 or something like that. Not even a, a far-fetched comparison either. Itsuno said he took inspiration from GT a5 when creating the open world so rockstar's brand of dynamic events is absolutely an inspiration here another way the game encourages you to engage with the world is the total lack of quest markers you have to find your own way in dragon's dogma 2 you can't just follow big glowing marks on your hud you actually need to follow instructions and find quest locations uh, unless you've got a pawn that knows the way already the pawn situation is another can of worms i'll open it later but it really sounds like Itsuno is very serious about making the world of Dragon's Dogma a dynamic and interesting place uh, to explore. And I, I'm super curious to see how he pulls it off. And number nine is The New Enemies, a game all about taking down gigantic beasts. And while the trailers shown so far haven't revealed a lot of new creatures to face off against, what has been revealed is definitely intriguing. Uh, a lot of returning monsters from the original game are here again, like Cyclops, Goblins, Griffins, Golems. They appear uh, pretty accurate to their original incarnations, but the trailers do show that they have some new tricks. What really intrigues me, though, are the new enemies. Uh, there are slimes that are impervious to physical damage, a sphinx which was shown briefly uh, as some kind of trickster who wants you to solve puzzles. If you get them wrong, the sphinx attacks. Apparently one of the most dangerous creatures in the game. There's also the Medusa who can true to form, turn its enemies into stone. Um, one very exciting thing I noticed from the ESRB notes uh, revealed that you're going to be able to cut off an enemy's head and use it as a weapon. Obviously, Medusa would be perfect for this. Like, does the game let you go full God of War and turn enemies to stone with a Medusa head? That would be pretty damn amazing if true. The beast that has me most excited is probably got to be this gigantic Greek statue uh, called the Talos. It's kind of where the game seems to go full Shadow of the Colossus. It's massive. Uh, you can damage it by climbing all over it and attacking weak points. There was nothing like this in the original game. Uh, certainly nothing this big and set piece like. So it really makes me want to know what else they have up their sleeve in terms of that. The original Dragon's Dogma is still one of the all-time best character creators in gaming. The variety of characters people were able to make with this thing is just insane. And it seems like matching or even exceeding uh, the quality of that was the priority here. Like the original, it's your standard set of sliders, but the level of detail afforded players is just so much better than in most games. Uh, you can make characters tiny, you can make them huge, skinny, fat, anything in between. Uh, what's especially unique 
is how you build your character actually affects your stats. It's not just cosmetic. Like, the heavier your character is, the greater their stamina, which controls how much stuff they can carry. The larger you are, the bigger your inventory, but also the slower you move. Height can also have a pretty big effect on your character. The taller you are, the faster you can run, and the longer your reach is. Uh, this sort of thing is a little divisive because it limits the kinds of creators you want to make, but that's also part of the Dragon's Dogma experience. In a lot of ways, the character creator is also a very fluid difficulty level setting. Uh, and one exciting new feature is um, you could place as other races. Like, other than human, you could be elven or beastron. Elves have their own customization options and their own language. From what I've seen, it seems like whether you're an elf or not changes whether you know the elven language, so you have to learn it or have a pawn who speaks it. The beastron, totally other story. These beastmen play an important role in the story, and playing as one can have a dramatic effect on how NPCs speak to you. And number seven is vocations. Uh, character creation is, of course, important, but your job class is what truly defines your character. The original game had three basic vocations, uh, the fighter, the mage, and strider. This game changes that dynamic by splitting the strider class into archer and thief, and from there you can unlock advanced vocations that dramatically alter how you play, uh, like the mystic spear hand, the magic archer, or the all-new trickster class. So far, we're aware of 10 total classes in the game, but it's likely that there are more, considering the many popular classes like assassin and mystic knight, uh, they, they haven't been revealed. It's just as likely that the 10 we've seen is everything. The first game only had nine, so who really knows? But, eh, I have a feeling there's more. The Trickster is one of the most unique classes I've seen in an action RPG, though. Rather than being about direct damage to enemies, they're about creating decoys that fool enemies into uh, attacking or generating fake walls that bait enemies into traps. Uh, they can also use smoke to make enemies attack each other or buff allies, which means they're primarily a support class. Uh, a lot of these classes look really fantastic. I mean, just look at anything the Mystic Spearhand is doing uh, in the class preview Capcom put out. But I do want to focus quickly on one more class before we move on the warfarer yes warfarer a special player only class that's basically the ultimate vacation these guys use every weapon in the game without restrictions uh they can learn skills from other classes they're basically the advanced class that lets you mix and match powers uh but it's otherwise weaker than the specialized classes one other new thing about vocations in Dragon's Dogma 2, there's a new vocation action button that is different based on your class. So fighters can block, thieves have a quick step, so stuff like that. A lot of interesting stuff here, in my opinion. And number six, the pawn system is back. A pawn's return in Dragon's Dogma 2. These guys are player-made support characters who have some frankly bizarre lore behind them. They're basically AI-controlled party members, but it's more complicated than it sounds. Uh, each player gets to make one of these guys at character creation and can recruit more support pawns from the Nexus, which are pawns that are made by other players. What's unique about them is they have adaptive AI that learns things through experience, so they start off the game fairly clueless, but as you play, they learn enemy weaknesses and combat strategies from how you fight. Uh, they also learn the terrain of the map. They can adopt certain habits from players. So, for example, if you heal too much when you're starting the game out, it's possible your pawn will learn that and uh, use healing items too much. So, uh, lead by example. To add to their characters, pawns can have their own inclinations and specializations that change uh, how their personality works or how they engage in combat. Uh, that's not all with pawns. Dragon's Dogma 2 also introduces this thing called Dragon Plague, which can affect pawns. It's unclear exactly how it works, but apparently pawns who travel between worlds too often are in danger of catching the Dragon Plague, which burns their eyes and they become conspicuously bold in their speech and behavior. Also, the game's website warns that later stages of the infection can lead to a devastating calamity, whatever that means. It's probably just a story thing, but it could be a danger. If your pawn becomes too popular online, it may lead to bad things. We don't know. I wouldn't put anything past Capcom, though. At number five, the combat is definitely more dynamic. Touched on it a little bit already, but it seems like Dragon's Dogma 2 is really making a concerted effort to make combat more dynamic and interesting. At its most basic, that means enemies will actually collide with walls. When they fall over, it's affected by physics. 
I like that. Climbing on monsters uh, seems even more powerful here. The game lets you stand on a beast's back and attack it from a standing position or jump to the ground to safety. Certain enemy behaviors from the original game remain the same, uh, but are more interesting here, like with the griffin. It used to be that when they'd fly up into the air, you'd eventually get thrown off no matter what, but now you can cling onto a griffin no, and no matter how far it flies up, uh, it's actually possible to ride it all the way back to its nest. You can smash dams to damage enemies with a flood of water. You can use enemies as makeshift bridges. And all the ways you can control monster movement with tricksters just really adds to the potential mayhem. The immersive physics combined with the baked-in gameplay systems is probably going to lead to some unusual and surprising results that I think are going to be pretty funny if everything works as the devs intended uh but you know we're waiting and seeing at number four there is not going to be any multiplayer uh, that's something that should be made clear like the original game there will be no multiplayer yes it looks like elden ring or monster hunter but it is strictly a single player game the pawn system allows for some degree of interactivity with other players because you can send out your pawn to be used in other people's games, but that's about it. And even though the Nexus where pawns are found, that's online, you can still play the entire game in offline mode. The game just generates some developer made pawns for you to pick from instead. I can't believe I really need to say it, but this single player game isn't always alone, so to speak. And a big thank you to Capcom for that. And number three, uh, there is only one save slot again. If there's one thing that got people kind of annoyed, it's for some reason uh, there is only one save slot. You can't take multiple characters with the same profile. You get one. And if you want to make a new character, you got to delete the old one. It's exactly the same thing as from the original game. But in this case, I don't think anyone would mind if Capcom modernized things just a little bit. Maybe this is just to limit the amount of pawns online. In the original game, your pawn was tied to the character you made and only got deleted if your save file was removed. So maybe it's a way to make it so there aren't millions of pawns in the Capcom servers, but it still kind of stinks, especially in a game as build focused as this one. At least on consoles, you can just play with a different account to start a fresh save without deleting your old one. But on PC, it's probably gonna be a little trickier. And number two, the frame rate is unlocked on consoles. There's been persistent speculation online that it's gonna release on consoles at 30 frames per second based off some preview footage, but the game's director actually responded by straight up saying the frame rate is unlocked and targeting 60 frames per second on consoles. That sounds better than a flat 30, but if the game's frame rate ends up being inconsistent, it could be worse than just leaving them locked. I don't know, I trust Capcom on this. Like, look at their other releases. They work pretty well. And the original game was actually pretty rough frame rate wise, but every recent game they have put out, like I said, solid performance. So I'm optimistic, even if a little bit cautiously. Obviously, PC, this isn't gonna be a problem. If you got a beefy enough PC, 60 frames per second should be a cinch, especially if the system requirements shown on Steam are accurate. Uh, it all depends on if the game gets a good PC port, obviously, which I'd probably worry about more than anything else. But again, Capcom's done a pretty damn good job with PC ports. I mean, in terms of putting out quality optimized games on multiple platforms, Capcom isn't a slouch in today's uh, bug happy release environment. They do it better, at least generally. I don't wanna say the framework won't be an issue because anything's possible. But at this point, I think Capcom is trustworthy to make things right. If it's rough at launch, uh, they'll fix it. There's a decent chance it won't be though. And finally, uh, the release date. This game obviously it has the potential to be one of the bigger games of the year. I, it's a possible monster. The original Dragon's Dogma was a rough gem, and if they manage to sand off the rough edges with the sequel, we could be looking at something that's really stand out. And even if it's not, and it's still sort of a janky mess like the original, it's a miracle it's coming out at all, and I'm here for it either way. Dragon's Dogma 2 is landing on March 22nd on PlayStation 5, Xbox Series, and PC. There's your usual special editions that get just some in-game items, but nothing I'm seeing here that sounds really essential. They're not doing an, an early access scheme or anything either, so there's one one release date, it's March 22nd. Uh, the PC version has Denuvo anti-tamper, which ain't great, but at least they're upfront about it. They're not trying to sneak it in at the last minute to avoid bad press like some other games out there. If that's a deal breaker, you probably want to know. Uh, but from what everything I've read, there's some concerns, but all the pre-release information sounds 
pretty good. It seems like they understand what people love about the first game and they're trying to build on it rather than try to dumb the game down and make it more appealing to casual players. And that's, for me, music to my ears. It may end up being an all-timer or it could be divisive as hell. Either way, it's gonna be an interesting release and I am there for it. That's all for today. Leave us a comment, let us know what you think. If you like this video, click like. If you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is a course of subscription. So click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications. And as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at Falcon the Hero. We'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.